Oh, lovely. Fan fiction season two is coming. You ever have a bruise and you know that it hurts when you poke it, so every now and then you poke it just to make sure that it still hurts? Uh, anyway, I'm gonna watch Wheel of Time season two. So let's recap what made season one so horrific, then we'll talk about the trailer for season two so that we're all caught up and ready to go unto the breach once more when it comes to Amazon on September 1st. So I'm not upset that they changed some things. You're always gonna have that. When you adapt a book onto screen, you gotta cut some things, you gotta modify some things, you're changing mediums but they broke the story entirely. This show shares almost nothing with these books other than the character names and the places. It doesn't even work internally to itself. First of all, it's greatest sin, it was boring. This was a boring show, which is really crazy because the first season was covering the first book, Eye of the World, and that book was pretty nonstop. Later books start to world build a lot more. The world gets much bigger, you have more characters, everybody kind of gets spread out. Things get a little draggy in books like 5, 6, 7 area, so if it can't make the first book exciting, what hope does this show have going forward? They tried to do this whole like, ooh, who's the dragon thing that went on way too long and actually hurt the story because it didn't allow us to develop the characters because everybody had to be a little mysterious. It was never a mystery in the book who was going to be the main character and they didn't need to do it in the show. Little contrived crap like that was all throughout the season and none of it landed. They made everything boring. Even the scary stuff like the Machin Shin, they reduced to being a cloud that told you things about yourself you didn't want to hear. In the book, it will literally eat your soul, and if you survive at all, you come out a husk of a human being. In the show, it whispered hurtful truths. You'll never finish all the games in your backlog. That backyard garden was a huge waste of money. No one wants to see the pictures of the meat you smoked. Has there ever been a better example of the kinds of people that congregate in Hollywood than them writing this super evil thing whose evil is telling you stuff that you don't want to hear about yourself? No, like, right-wing pundit or any commentator could lampoon these people better than that. Absolute own goal. Ooh, self-burn. Those are rare. And the whole Who is the Dragon game played into this gender stuff that they wanted to do so badly. And what's stupid is with a book like Wheel of Time, they didn't have to. This book is a great commentary on gender roles and interactions. It's diverse. It subverts things. It swings at both sides. It should have been perfect for today's political climate and somehow they messed it up. The book was all about how men and women are at their best when they work together. And the reason humanity is in a weak spot is because this evil dark one has kicked a leg out from under their stool because they tainted the male half of this magical true source. So the men go crazy when they try to use it so the men and women can never work together. There's also a lot of humor like when the men and women just do not understand each other. The very first town we're introduced to, Emmons Field, it has a men's council that thinks they're running the town with the mayor and then there's also a women's circle and they think they're running the town also and it's such a classic battle of the sexes and it's presented fairly all throughout the story. One of my favorite gags in the first books is how all three boys think the other two are total ladies men like every time they're in a confusing situation with a woman they think oh the other two guys would totally know how to handle this and all three of them think that <laughs> none of us actually know what we're doing panties no they're panties with a d panties panties <laughs> say panties like a normal person we also have a lot of like the thick guy communication thing where the the women are talking about something without actually talking about it and the guys just are completely not getting it at all and jordan does a really good job of presenting these scenarios without making the women look tricky and manipulative and conniving and also not making the guys look stupid and dumb and, and witless. He's just presenting these different ways that we communicate as genders. The show, however, wants to be a feminist power fantasy fever dream so badly and the main character barely does anything. This guy is a tourist in his own story. When he defeats the big bad at the end of the show, he only is able to do so because of a trinket that Moraine gave to him and also realizing in a hallucination that he doesn't own Egwene and she needs to let her go and be an independent woman. Seriously, that is how he finds the power to overcome the bad guy. That ending was on purpose because it allowed for his female companions to actually win the larger battle outside instead of him doing it as he did in the book and that wasn't a male power trip in the book he does it completely by accident he's out of control 
it scares the crap out of him because of the power that he's not able to control. It's it's designed to tell us, the reader, how awesome and huge this power is and how small he is in comparison to it and how dangerous it is if he can't control it. That final battle was hilarious, by the way. I mean, CGI made the Flash look pristine the blocking was awful you know the final scene where the girls just sort of walk in from nowhere they're standing in the middle of a, a barren rocky field outside of a fortress for god knows what reason and then they broke continuity by having somebody get raised from the dead also that last episode or two episodes uh they decided to turn agomar into a douchebag instead of the consummate gentleman leader that he is because the writers still think that's a really clever subversion the show also wanted to do modern race politics in the casting which made the world feel samey and took away all interest and actual diversity from the people modern fantasy shows love doing this and you can't tell where you are because every single town looks like a college welcome pamphlet this casting actually screwed up the real story. Rand is supposed to look so different, stick out like a sore thumb from everybody else in his town because he's not from town. He is supposed to look like one of these Aeel people that the whole world went to war against, which is why throughout his travels, some people are nervous around him or they react to him with outright hostility like this guy Uno who was a freaking white guy in the middle of what is supposed to be clearly an Asian warrior culture. One of these things is not like the others. One of these things doesn't belong. The reason high fantasy books do this kind of stuff is so that you, the reader, know where you are in the world and it creates a unique world. And it creates tension sometimes when cultures clash. For you non-bookish folks, high fantasy is not a value judgment about the quality of the book. High fantasy is like a completely made up world like Wheel of Time. Low fantasy is uh, like a, a known place, but with fantastical elements, like Percy Jackson would be low fantasy. Often you'll see authors doing mashups where they'll take clearly recognizable cultural things and combine them together. Like in Brandon Sanderson's Stormlight books, he's got this race called the Unkalaki, which uh, other people call the, the Horn Eaters, because that's easier. They are very clearly supposed to be Samoan, but they have very red hair. Wheel of Time does the exact same thing. The people of Terabon, for example, are fair-skinned, often black blonde but they have middle eastern and north african influence you can see it with the translucent face veils that they wear or the fez hats the sea folk the mariners of the book are very clearly black but they have indian and arab influence in their culture and dress again this is very important for the story when you have a fantasy setting where people tend to stay inside their borders and they all look and, and act and dress the same and you have some people come in that look and dress and act differently they get treated differently and that can be used to drive the story create conflict but in the show they didn't bother to display any of these different cultures or dress and they made sure to cast this wide diverse array of people which does not make sense in this setting the characters in the show are also garbage they bear no similarity whatsoever to the people of the same name in the books matt for example is a thieving just straight up piece of shit instead of the lovable reluctant hero that we all know from the book seriously matt might be one of the best characters in this series Yes, he's sarcastic, goofy, aloof, sometimes a little coarse, but when things go down, you're rooting for Matt. Rand in the show is just broody, seriously barely does anything, despite being the main character. He spends the entire eight episodes being led around by Egwene and Moraine, which bears a slight resemblance to the book at first, but nowhere near to the extent that happened in the show. Going forward, we most assuredly will not see the same Rand arc from the books. He was such a great take on the chosen one trope. He starts getting his own ideas about what to do very early on. We see his stubborn streak come out after people keep telling him he's the chosen one, he's the savior, whatever. He puts Tommy Lee to shame and starts taking charge. People keep trying to push him around and tell him what he has to do to fulfill the prophecy, what he needs to do because he's the chosen one. And then he takes the attitude of, oh no, 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 no. We're gonna do whatever I say because I'm the chosen one, as you have all said, and anyone that doesn't like it can talk to my boy Ruark right here. Sometimes you gotta put it on the table, son, let him see it. In the books, we get such an interesting dance between him and Moraine, because she was raised at court. She knows how to play these games. She knows how to subtly influence and play people. She knows all of that subtextual crap that goes on in high society, and she's trying to lead him and show him how to do it. 
he's a backwoods country boy. So he's like, uh, no, I'm not having any of this crap. I'm going to say what I say. And that's it. In one scene, he's got a bunch of lords and they're squabbling with him. They, they want to talk about taxes and who's going to pay for what. And they want to go to war under him because they just want to use him as a means to, you know, expand their territory. Maureen keeps trying to give him these pointers on how to lead and what to do with these guys and not be taken advantage of and whatever. He lets these guys talk for a while and then finally says, okay, you know what? We are going to march your armies as a matter of fact to help people displaced by this other war and you rich bastards will be paying for it out of your expansive treasuries and if you don't like it i'll just hang you it's an interesting part of that book because he shows that he can lead by just cutting through the crap instead of going along with the games however it also plays into the idea that he might be going crazy because he's becoming much more impulsive and violent than he ever was throughout season one perrin is on the verge of tears the entire time because of a stupid manufactured emotional moment in the first few minutes of the show this one bothers me the most because perrin is my absolute favorite character he's ferdinand he's a gentle giant i wanted to genuinely name my first son perrin or at least get it into his middle name it would have fit too my son is enormous but he's such a gentleman Egwene and nynaeve in the show are extremely annoying and it sort of mirrors what happens in the books in the books they do think they know more than they do and they try to boss everybody around but it's clear that they're not doing a good job and they're in over their heads and it provides character growth as the books go forward in the show they were just in charge and knew what to do and i don't think that that's ever going to be shown to be a bad thing we also added a bunch of dumb crap with land and the warders like i said i'm not upset when a movie or tv show cuts stuff from a book because you have to you can't fit it all in but when you cut things and then that's to make room because of crap that you made up, now I'm pissed. The only change I thought was any good at all was Lan himself. In the book, he basically has no expressions. He has the tiniest of expression changes and the narrator is like, that's a huge deal for a guy like Lan. There's no way that an actor could portray that. And it actually would have looked like bad acting if they tried to. So it was a good idea to have him speak and emote more. And loyal. Oh, Loyal, what did they do to you? Uh, like, I tried to write a joke about this, and I'm so disappointed in what they did to Loyal, I don't even have anything funny that I can say. All I have are disappointed noises to make. Uh, <sighs> come, I can't, ugh. Seriously. <sighs> Lastly, everybody is screwing all the time. As usual with garbage creators, they add sex to cover for terrible writing. You believe that I'm going to read Fourth Wing? Absolutely not. I can already tell that's going to be crap. It's just dragon sex and the story will be terrible. Right away, episode one, Rand and Egwene are in the sack, which again breaks the story because these are supposed to be innocent backwoods kids who are basically engaged by popular demand. They don't even understand their feelings for each other. This again is important for the story because these characters start at a lower place so that 13 books later we can see their growth as all of these characters all the emmons fielders are so different from when we first meet them Nynaeve and land banging in the first season that's great they're supposed to be reserved characters don't want to admit their feelings for each other but nope Nope, no build up to that relationship whatsoever. Moraine and Swan are having an affair that feels like it was written by a horny 13 year old boy. And they're gonna meet up together and Secret's gonna be so hot, oh my God. And then she's gonna be like, oh, you need to get on your knees. Yeah. On your knees. Oh, you thought I was joking? No, that was a real line written and performed by so-called professionals. And that's just what made it into the show. Reddit had a supposedly leaked script of the first episode that detailed Matt banging some village girl and stealing her bracelet. And there were notes to give special attention to female power and pleasure in the scene, which is a concept that I'm not opposed to. Fellas, you really should be shooting for a two to one O ratio. Don't listen to DJ Khaled, but it was going to be gratuitous in this episode for no reason and would only serve to make Matt look like more of a piece of shit. We could go scene by scene and deconstruct this dreck, but that would require that I rewatch season one and I have no desire. So let's look at the trailer for the upcoming season two. Let's start on a high note. This song, Control by Halsey, is an absolute banger. And when I was looking for it, I also discovered that she wrote the theme for Diablo 4. I don't know if she just makes really cool 
music or if she maybe is a secretly huge nerd. Great music for the trailer. Also, it looks like the sets are getting bigger and nicer. It appears that the production quality is going to be increasing for this season. Also, a really good idea to give the different magical flows different colors. Not only does it just look nice, but it also gives us an insight into how they're doing things, which does play into the story later on. We initially get some shots of the Dark One. Obviously, he didn't die. He's going to be influencing things a lot more now. We also get this shot of the Demani, which are women who can channel, do the magic, but they are enslaved. I'm interested to see where they go, but I don't really understand the whole mouth guard thing. And you also see them like strutting and looking really badass, which doesn't fit the tone at all. These women are are absolutely broken they are treated like and worse than animals they're not cool the parts of the book about them were like downright uncomfortable to read about don't recognize who this bloody woman is supposed to be i'm guessing land fear doing like a rebirth thing i know this part is picky but this scene with Nynaeve going through the arches bothers me it is clearly described in the book that they have these three silvery metal arches that are all touching each other on the edges normally little stuff like this wouldn't bother me but i'm already pissed off at the showrunners about their absolute disrespect of the source material so little crap like that that they obviously changed on purpose it just further demonstrates how much this is fan fiction. We get this scene with Rand having a little swagger, which is an attitude that I hope he keeps up. However, I think this is probably just the scene where he is going to meet the Amberlin. That is definitely a cat crosses the courtyard walk. We get some quick cuts of various characters. I'm hoping that we see more of this Perrin and the wolves. I think Elias got cut entirely though. Looks like we have a quick scene of Lanfear here behind Rand. And then we appear to have Rand asking Loghain for channeling advice. I don't know if I'm just remembering things incorrectly but i'm pretty sure that he gets advice from a different forsaken that landfear captures for him and allows him to have just a little bit control to to teach him i can't remember that guy's name but that's even a few books away at this point in the story Logan is very much gentled so the wheel of fanfic continues we get some shots of the sean chan which i'm very interested to see what they do with though i'm probably going to be disappointed the costume design does look very good though i'm wondering how they're going to do the the grom which is are like large toad like creatures with three eyes that they're supposed to have on chains the soldiers are supposed to have armor that looks like bugs. I can't quite tell from this shot what, if that's accurate or not. Uh, the rulers do look like they brought all of their most comfortable, fabulous possessions, which is what happened in the, in the books. You've got the long nails. It's looking really good. Oh, good. We've got more Moraine and Swan relationship. I guess you just make a scissor when you can't write a story. Then we finish out the trailer with some quick cuts of cool looking scenes and, and cool sounding lines overall very well done trailer but it just doesn't have me excited for the next season they really haven't been pushing this one very much and i'm not sure if that's because they don't want to give too much away in the trailers or if amazon just doesn't want to put a bunch of money into marketing because they're not expecting a lot of viewers for this in any case i will be checking out the first few episodes when they drop on september 1st and then we can talk about our feelings shortly thereafter so what do you think about this trailer and this upcoming season how do you feel about it how did you feel about the first season i'm very interested to see what you guys thought i appreciate you watching and i'll see you next time